All right, joining us now from the Seattle Times to talk all things Kalen DeBoer's first season, it is Mike Burrell. Sir, welcome to the Style of Verbal. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for your time. Um, Washington last season, quite a season. 10 wins in the regular season, won the bowl game 11-2, and two, all with a new coach. With that as the backdrop, if you're grading Kalen DeBoer A through F, how do you grade him? Yeah, it's an easy A. I mean, it's a different situation than many others where I don't think he had to totally rebuild the roster. I mean, there was talent to be had there. I think he talks so much about coming in and retention and him re, you know, re-recruiting the, the current players, obviously, in the transfer portal era. That's everything. But Washington had a talented team. It was just a situation under Jimmy Lake in 2021. Everything kind of fell apart. But if you look at the, the blue chip ratio, Washington had the players there. They brought in a couple yeah. guys. But, I mean, he had the ingredients to make it work. But you, you bring in his system, you bring in his mentality, his attitude, his staff. And, uh, you know, 4-8 and eight to 11-2, and two, you can't ask for much more than that, uh, you know, as a fan base. No, no. I, I want to try to get into as much of that as I can. I do want to start at the very beginning, though. The promotion of Jimmy Lake, kind of a spectacular failure. At the time, there wasn't an obvious candidate to replace Lake. So what was the reaction from you, from others, from the Husky community to Kalen DeBoer getting that gig in the first place? Yeah, I think it was it was lukewarm. I think there was interest and excitement about the idea of bringing in a proven offensive coordinator, guy who had had some head coaching experience, but it was bringing that system with him because you went from, you know, the John Donovan offense, which was like you kind of mm -hmm. mentioned, a spectacular failure. You're yeah. trying to recruit fullbacks, H backs, they're spinning back 50 years into the past, um, slowing the game down. It just wasn't, it wasn't an aesthetically pleasing brand of football, nor was it a successful one. So I think people were on board with the idea of, you know, bringing in a guy who can really maximize their wide receivers. They had guys like Roma Dunze, Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk. Those guys were on the roster. They just didn't have anything to do. So yeah, right. it wasn't a big name hire. I think some people certainly wanted the splash and, you know, there was other names that were thrown around that would have been, you know, more deserving of, of that accolade. But Kalen was a guy who's, you know, from, you know, Midwest, but had coached on the West Coast, had those kind of recruiting, you know, uh, accolades and, and experience and, and brought the system that I think people were excited about. You know, we've done a bunch of these, Mike, these episodes where we're talking about first year coaches. And one thing that stuck out to me is this real contrast between first year guys, first year, first time head coaches, let's say guy like a Brent Venables, who's still sort of figuring out the rhymes and rhythms of being the guy versus coaches who have done it before, such as Kalen DeBoer, who has plenty of experience, obviously was at Fresno State fairly recently, but was very successful at a lower level of college football before getting the gig at Washington. Did you see that contrast at all last season, moving away from a first timer in Jimmy Lake to a guy like Kalen DeBoer who had done it before? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, like you said, you kind of don't really know when someone has the majority of their head coaching experience at a place like Sioux Falls, how, how transferable is that? You know, right. exactly. about the necessity of, of head coaching experience. And that's really what they wanted when you, you had a Jimmy Lake who had never been a head coach on any level of football. Um, but Kalen comes in and I think immediately he had an understanding of what his role was. And he really, he hired a good staff. He brought in a good staff and he delegated where you see him at practice and he's talking to everybody. He's talking to donors. He's talking to other, you know, we're talking to recruits. He's, you know, he's circulating. Yeah, I yeah. think a real comfort level with what his role is and who is around him. And he just sort of has a, an implicit trust in the people that he's brought in. And with Jimmy previously, I think it was a guy who wanted to do everything and be everything to everyone and was probably stretching himself a little thin in that way. Kalen, I don't think he was trying to force it. I think he understood what his role is and he understood that he hired good people that he trusted to do their jobs as well. And it just seemed a little bit more effortless, you know, the minute that he stepped in the door. Yeah. We often use the house analogy when a new coach comes in, right? Got to get your house in order. You hear that all the time. Clearly it was a tumultuous time for Washington after the Jimmy Lake era, moving now into something new. What was the state of that proverbial house? Mike, when Kalen DeBoer took over, what was job number one for him? I mentioned earlier, but the job was certainly retention. When you come, 
you know, you have a four and eight season where it was just so negative. The idea that, you know, Jimmy Lake gets fired before the regular season's even over after, you know, shoving a player on the sidelines of national television, it just was a sour vibe around the program. And I think it was a pretty stark turn from having a Chris Peterson where you thought, okay, this guy is the molder of men. And the, the players who came to play for Chris Peterson revered him and understood that he led the program a certain way. And it just felt like it had been a little bit defaced, at least the perception of it nationally, when you have things like that happen. So, you know, you have a guy come in like Kalen, who really is a people person and wants players to understand that he's about more than the on-field product. And I think hiring guys like Jamarcus Shepard and, and some of these guys to come in, being able to come in and lock down Roma Dunze to come back when there hadn't been any real offensive production, Jalen McMillan, uh, bringing in Michael Penix Jr., being able to sell their vision, sell their system to guys who were talented but hadn't been able to maximize what they did, that was massive. You've got the pass rushers, the ZTF, Braylon Trice, some guys that could have gone portal, some guys that could have gone draft. Uh, they didn't need to build from scratch, but they did need to hold on to the talent that they had, and they were able to do no. that last offseason. What, you've mentioned this a couple times, Mike, but what what is Caleb DeBoer's personality? Like if we're comparing him to Chris Peterson, even to Jimmy Lake, from a culture standpoint, what does this team feel like? It feels like a lower level school in the best possible way, I would say at this point, where, you know, Kalen DeBoer is from Millbank, South Dakota. I wrote a big story where I went to South Dakota. The motto of Millbank, South Dakota is you'll like Millbank. <laughs> Straight to the point. Yeah. You know, the people yeah. talk about South Dakota nice. And I mean, Kalen and Ryan Grubb, for that matter, some of these big time assistants, they act like they don't know they're at Washington and that they welcome you in, <laughs> talk to you, they see you on the sideline as the reporter for the Seattle Times or anywhere else. And Kalen will come and talk to you for 20 minutes while practice is going on uh, and seems genuinely interested and genuinely engaged. There isn't, I mean, winning helps in terms of not having an adversarial relationship with media and with kind of the swirling factors surrounding a program. But in terms of the people they brought in, there's so many guys from NAIA, Division Three. It's these guys who didn't come up at Alabama. And I still think yeah. they have a certain perspe perspective that is just unique to being from South Dakota, being from Ryan Grubb, went to Buena Vista University in Iowa. He was a hog farmer for seven years before deciding to coach. <laughs> it's a very specific background and mentality that comes out of some of these guys' backgrounds. And I think that's what has drawn Kalen to some of his assistants. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, whatever they're doing is working. The results, at least in year one, spoke for themselves. As I said at the top, 10 win regular season. You beat Texas in the bowl. An enormous leap forward on offense, led, of course, by Michael Penix, but a really strong ground game that probably didn't get its due at least on the national conversational front. Um, 2,000 yard receivers, I believe. Like it all just clicked. How did Kalen DeBoer do that, for lack of better terms? It's a good problem, but I mean, there's a, a conversation to be had about, you know, when, with Ryan Grubb calling the plays, who deserves the credit? You always do that. Is it Kalen DeBoer who's kind of overseeing everything? Is it Ryan Grubb who's calling the plays and is pulling the strings? Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Ryan Grubb obviously was paid that way this offseason and had enough interest in other jobs this offseason uh, sure. where there's no credit to go around. But they just, you know, they occupy, they, they run an offense that really keeps people on their toes. And you've got a guy like Penix who comes in and had such a familiarity because he was running that same offense at Indiana. He had great success under Kalen DeBoer as his offensive coordinator in 2019. Uh, he came in and just seemed to understand everything immediately. And I think it's as simple as you've got Roma Dunze, you've got Jalen McMillan, they've got two tight ends they like, they've got Jalen Polk. They got their guys into advantageous situations and they didn't overcomplicate it. They ran plays that their players wanted to run and they didn't get too in the weeds with, you know, with doing things that were probably overcomplicated. The offensive line, I mean, you talk about the this the skill uh the skill positions and those all were excellent last year. But you had an offensive line that gave up, I think, seven sacks for the season. Yeah. Right. Uh, truly an incredible number. And when you see Penix, I mean, he made some incredible throws and some incredible plays, but there was also just, you know, as, as prototypical a pocket in a lot of those situations as you could possibly hope for. So that's kind of a big thing turning forward when you're replacing three offensive linemen, which they're doing, can they continue to cultivate that environment and allow him to be as comfortable as he was? 
Yeah. And I mean, there were so many questions about Penix when he transferred over from Indiana, right? He had a bit of an issue with injury that was in no small part, um, probably the biggest question about his move to Washington. Um, he did have that one good season under Kalen DeBoer, but the question was, of course, how's it going to transfer to a different place, different players, et cetera, et cetera. A huge renaissance season of, of you know, to some extent for Penix. Did that surprise you? Did that surprise people around the program? How, how did that go over? Obviously, a lot of excitement with the season he turned in, but was there surprise associated with that as well? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, this time last year, I just wrote about this. This time a year ago, he was in a three-way quarterback competition with Dylan Morris and Sam Heward, where all three yeah. guys were starting reps. That went pretty deeply into the fall with all three guys. I mean, Penix, I think a bunch of us who were around the team assumed throughout last offseason that he was eventually going to be the guy, but it wasn't obvious. He wasn't a super no. practice his last offseason. And we all knew his history. It was the same thing of, okay, you get him in, he might look really good, but what's your plan for game seven? Because he's never played more than six games in a season. Right. Um, but it turns out, I mean, what he turned into, that wasn't the perception surrounding him, swirling around him going into the year. Um, my personal thought was that, okay, this is a guy who's going to be an above average quarterback in the Pac-12. But so was Jacob Eason in 2019, and he didn't light the world on fire. So I certainly didn't expect what he became. became. I don't think many people around the program did. Kalen DeBoer might have. But also, when you talk about the issues with him, I mean, he's always had tremendous arm talent. Um, and he hadn't, at Indiana, been in a situation where he could be truly confident, one, in the system, and two, in the pocket, in his protection, in his skill players. So the foundation around him put him in a position to truly flourish into what he became. Yeah, de definitely a better supporting cast. You mentioned Ryan Grubb. I want to go back to Ryan Grubb for a second. Had a chance to go to Alabama, decided to stay put. He's making, what, $2 million this season after the pay bump. Is he as big a deal as his salary would suggest? That's the question that, you know, that we just yeah. about a minute ago. It's like you don't know how to separate the coach from the system or vice versa. But you talked to Kalen DeBoer. We, we talked to him last media day before anyone knew what this team was going to be or what Ryan Grubb was capable of. And he said, hey, me and Grubb, built this offense together over the past eight years. I mean, they were together at Eastern Michigan. They were together yeah. at Fresno State, and they're still together. They've worked together since uh, Sioux Falls in like 2007. So, I mean, they're inextricable. Um, so there is a question of who deserves what, but I don't think they particularly care. I, I think it will be interesting to take him out of this program, which will eventually happen, and drop him in somewhere else and see what happens. But this is also the quarterback's coach. So this is a guy who made Penix better. And you talk to these players and they say that they've never been more prepared. They've never felt more prepared from a game plan st standpoint going into a game. So I think he deserves a lot of what he's getting. It's just hard to uh, specify when you, when you go play to play, is this a DeBoer thing? Is this a Ryan Grubb thing? Is this a Mike Penix thing? They're happy it's a Washington thing at this point, but beyond yeah. that, it's hard to separate. Yeah. And we should also mention DeBoer did this mostly with somebody else's roster and some transfers, right? But what does the future state of Washington look like, at least on offense, when it's 100% of Kalen DeBoer's guys, 100% of his schemes? How much different, if at all, do, do you think that looks from what we saw this past season? Not a whole lot different. I think if you look at the area where they really overhauled things was the running back position because under Jimmy Lake, he said, we want... 225 pound guys who we're going to hand the football to and they are going to put their shoulders down and run forward for as long as they possibly can. And then Kalen comes in and Ryan Grubb comes in and they said, we want our guys to catch the football. We want them to be pass protecting. We want them to be split out wide as a wide receiver, very much kind of more of a, of a modern style of football. So they sort of emptied out the running back room in some ways. And all of a sudden you've got transfer, port transfer portal guys coming in you know, I got Dylan Johnson from Mississippi State this offseason, Daniel Nagata from Arizona State. They brought in Wayne Talapapa from Virginia last offseason. Huh. That's the one place where you can see that the personnel did not match what they were trying to accomplish. Outside of that, offensively at least, they loved what they saw in the offensive line. They brought in the quarterback that they needed. The wide receivers were already there. So I think running back was the place where they thought, okay, we've got, we've got to change quickly. And they've been able to do that.
Yeah. A great season, as I said earlier, on the ground last year for the Huskies. Um, defense, though, a little bit of a different story. And I, I don't want to demean it too much. They went from being, what, a top 15 unit pretty consistently under Chris Peterson to last year a top 50 unit, which is not a disaster. It's just not as good as they had been in the past. Um, both seasons under Jimmy Lake, a bit of a step back as compared to Chris Peterson as well. To what do we attribute any regression? Is it a talent thing? Is it a scheme thing? Like, what do they do this coming season to try and fix it and get back to where it's been? You know, it's some of everything. And it's it's very easily diagnosable when you talk about this is a team that rushed the passer pretty well last season and stopped the run pretty well and really philosophically said, we're going to put more people at the line of scrimmage and we're going to stop the run and we're going to rush the passer. And when you do that, you're leaving an awful lot of corners, DBs on islands, and you're trusting them to get the job done. And they had a tremendous amount of injuries at the cornerback position last year. They also didn't have a Trent McDuffie anymore. They didn't have a Kyler Gordon anymore. And they struggled and their corners really struggled and their pass defense was abysmal last season, which at Washington is a very stark difference. But in a Jimmy Lake defense, he says, we're going to put eight DBs in the game or whatever it is, and we're going to go 20 yards back and we'll give up the eight yard reception, but not the 50 yard reception. Philosophically, it was quite a bit different last season where they're trying to cause havoc. They're trying to rush the passer. They're trying to stop the run. And they're hoping that their corners can, can beat you in press coverage. And they got burned an awful lot. So the question is going to be, I think that's going to continue to be the way they're going to play this game. Can they bring in cornerbacks that can really play man and can take that load and can be on an island and survive, especially in this conference where there's an awful lot of good skilled players and good quarterbacks. Uh, they brought in Jabbar Muhammad from uh, Oklahoma State, who's a solid player. They've got some other guys coming up. I wouldn't be surprised if they add more via the portal. But I think they're going to play how they're going to play. And the question is going to be, can they cover in that kind of a defense? And we don't know the answer yet. No, we don't. And Kalen DeBoer has a track record for being an offensive genius of sorts, but um, it was a fair question when he took the post, what happens on defense, right? What is, what does defense look like from here? Um, you know, how, how do folks around the program feel about the state of the roster talent wise on defense? Is it, it, does it feel like it's going in a better direction momentum wise? I know you said they're trying to add some help at corner, but just across the board, is it, does it feel like it's going somewhere? I think that's a good question. And I was thinking about that literally at practice today, just the question of how many, you got the draft coming up in a couple of weeks. How many of these guys are draft guys defensively? Cause I mean, there's right. an eight year run there under Jimmy Lake where, okay, here's the cornerback. He'll be drafted in the, in the first two rounds. We'll bring in the next guy. He'll be drafted in the first two rounds. I think they got a lot of solid dudes on this defense. I think they feel confident about some of these spots, but I don't know that they've got that dude. I don't know that they've got the all conference, all American type guy. They like a guy like Eddie Lafoscio at linebacker. They brought in Raylan Goforth from USC. Like I said, Jabbar Muhammad. They've got some, some corners they like. They've got some defensive linemen they like. I just don't know that they've got the game changer disruptor. And that's like, that's the difference in terms of when, this is a program that now wants to do more. They want to win the Pac-12. They want to go to the college football playoff. They think that they're capable of that, and they're all saying that. Do they have game changers on defense that can allow you to win a game in the Pac-12 championship game or, or compete in a college football playoff? I'm not convinced about that. I think it could go either way. I think they've got solid players. I just don't know that they have transformational players. Right. And certainly – when you compare them to a 2016 playoff team that had Vita Vea, Greg Gaines, all <laughs> the cornerbacks, Taylor Rapp, Buda Baker, that's not this this defense. But the offense is a heck of a lot better. So we'll see how it all kind of balances out. Yeah. I'm curious to get your take on the recruiting operation because, you know, on some level, we have to talk about what Oregon is doing as well. Because in the Pacific Northwest, Dan Lanning is sucking up all the oxygen in the recruiting room. He's been hyper aggressive on the trail. He's been really aggressive in the portal as the other big dog in the region, Washington. What is Kalen DeBoer trying to do to counter that momentum? I don't think that he cares that much about being Dan Lanning, Dan Lanning or comparing himself. But I mean, if you look at what Washington did 
they were a top 25. They're right about 25 in terms of their recruiting class, which was a step forward based off of the lows that they had plummeted to under Jimmy Lake in the last couple of years, which were pretty stark. Yeah. Uh, I think that they're looking for guys that are going to fit exactly what they do offensively, defensively, schematically. And what they talk about here is trying to win in the state of Washington and then, of course, dominate California. I think California, more so than the state of Washington, is absolutely their biggest focus by a multitude of a thousand. They want to get the guys that they want out of the state of California. You're never, all, you're never going to beat USC for everybody. You're not going to beat Oregon for everybody. But I think they've handpicked certain guys that they want to throw everything at in the state of California. And then also they've got, you know, their, their recruiting guru is a guy named Courtney Morgan, who's been around, who's been to Michigan before he went to Washington, who's worked at Fresno with Kalen DeBoer. And he's developed relationships in sort of random places that has allowed them to recruit, you know, pull a four-star kid, Curly Reed, a cornerback out of Louisiana last year. They're, they're recruiting certain areas that they really haven't focused on before because they've got certain relationships that are sort of unique to them at this point. Big picture. Yeah. I think, the question, big picture is, can they be what they were under, under Chris Peterson, which was towards the end there, they were a top 15 type recruiting operation. If they can do that and they can add to the portal to guys who want to play in this offense, which will be an awful lot of QBs and receivers and tight ends and running backs. I think that's the way that they intend to go forward. Yeah. And, and the other thing, Mike, you mentioned this earlier, but Washington has had a few guys transfer out. Sure. Everybody has, but Kalen DeBoer has done a really good job keeping guys around and whether that's keeping guys out of the portal, whether that's keeping draft eligible talent from going to the draft. Um, so much of the emphasis in today's recruiting landscape is about recruiting your own guys. And he, he seems to have done that pretty well from afar. No question. I mean, it's, a very unique situation in the fact that they might not have anyone drafted in two weeks for the first time in more than a decade. And they could well be celebrating that because yeah. they could have had seven guys drafted and all of them came back. I mean, you talk about Penix. Most people expected him to go. Roma Dunze certainly could have went. Jalen McMillan probably could have went. Braylon Trice could have went. ZTF potentially could have went. They got literally a hundred percent of the people they wanted back back. So much so that I think that they had to sort of change some of the recruiting because they didn't expect some of these people to be here right now. So uh, I think that's maybe the biggest testament to DeBoer is his ability to sell himself, his vision, his program, his culture, the family environment. Everyone talks about that. It's not new. It's not like cool. But I do think that's what they hang their hat on. And, and you know, NIL is certainly a, a piece of that. And I think the fan base has tried to compare itself to Oregon and say you need to do more from an NIL perspective, but I think they're doing quite a bit when you think about Penix coming back and some of those guys because they love the program, but that's not the entire selling point. <laughs> not anymore. No, I, I, that was actually going to be my next question about the NIL operation because you know we're talking recruiting, we're talking transfer portal, everything goes hand in hand with NIL now. But how does that operation compare, maybe not to Oregon, Oregon maybe is an extreme example, but just to other programs that Oregon, or just to other programs that Washington compares itself to? You know, they've got the infrastructure in terms of having Montlake Futures, a sort of an organization that, that kind of funnels everything into the NIL operation. I don't think they're doing it the same way that an Oregon is in terms of they're not being nearly as brazen and, and out front about what a high school kid might be able to you know, benefit or how that kid might be able to benefit coming straight through. I think there's been more um, focus from a UW perspective about when you get on campus, here's how we can help you. And if you're going to go into the draft or if you're thinking about the draft, like we just talked about, here are the reasons that you'd benefit by staying. I think retention has been as big of a focus for their NIL operations as actual recruitment. And I also think there's been probably more focus in the transfer portal recruitment piece than in trying to add blue chip high school kids. So I certainly think that they have the infrastructure here to be able to compete with some other big time schools. I do think that they maybe are approaching it philosophically a little bit differently, not to, not to um, imply that they're not attacking uh, the high school uh, classes uh, just as just as well. But I do think that there's an awful lot of focus going to both the portal and also retention when someone breaks out. 
Yeah, one one thing that sort of dawned on me, Mike, when I was looking through their recruiting class from this past cycle, as like you said, twenty fifth nationally according to twenty four seven. It's not the type of class that's going to blow you away, but it is smart. It actually reminds me of the move to hire DeBoer in the first place because Washington didn't overthink it. It doesn't look like DeBoer overthought it with this class. It's skewed towards defense with a dash of playmakers. Um, but it ultimately, I think, is guys that are going to fit the system and hopefully guys that they can plug and play and, and use in short order to try and make the thing work a little bit better. Are there newcomers in that class that you expect to take a step in, maybe provide a boost where it's needed? Could be freshmen, could be transfers, just new names that people should watch for. The thing is with this team, offensively, what we've talked about is you know, you could be a four star, or whatever, big time receiver. There's just no chance, really. There's right. so deep in specific rooms. I do think if you think there's an opportunity and you looked at the class, like you just said, why it's logical, they just added a ton of DBs. And there's like, we're going to try, to, we're going to add four star DBs, which give them credit for doing that. And we're going to throw everyone into the mix and see who, who emerges. And last year, they, they almost physically ran out of guys at a certain point from an injury standpoint. They're not going to do that this year. But I, I think, you know, you look at a Curly Reed coming from Louisiana. There's uh, Leroy Bryant coming from uh, California. These cornerbacks, Caleb Presley is already on campus, uh, a local kid. There's a safety, Vincent Holmes. I look at the DBs in terms of having a path to that. I don't think that this is a program that needs a freshman to come in and, and save them at any one place. But that defensive backfield is where they're, they have an opportunity to – hopefully, you know, create depth is really what they need because they didn't have any semblance of that in the back end. Basically, last year we talked to DeBoer before the season and he said, like, we need to stay healthy at certain spots to be okay. And they didn't stay healthy at cornerback and they still survived it, but just barely. Mike, there are a great number of coaches who had an amazing first year and then everything after that first season was compared to what they did in year one, right? So double digit wins, they finish with 11, they win the bowl game again against Texas. Um, realistically, you look at the schedule, you look at the roster coming back, It how much room is there to grow? What is realistic from the fan base in terms of expectations now um, a year into this thing with DeBoer? That's what's really changed about kind of the mentality of this program. And what we haven't seen is, is how they operate when they're not catching teams by surprise. Right. And a year ago, you go to, if you want, I went to one of the uh, winter workouts a year ago when he had just gotten there and they have certain periods where they'll stop. And one of the coaches will, will get in front of everybody and talk. And Ryan Grubb said, you know, was yelling, this is not a rebuild over. <laughs> and over again. This is not a rebuild. And now everyone knows it's not a rebuild, but how does this program work when they're the ones being gunned for when they're the ones, you know, who, are coming in as a top 10 team potentially with playoff aspirations. And you talk to every one of these guys, Penix just talked about wanting to win a national championship. Jalen McMillan talked about that after winning the bowl game. Uh, so how they do in terms of coming in as a team with those expectations is very, very different from where they were a year ago. So I don't know how they're going to react to that, but certainly there's a different level of expectation on Kalen DeBoer and everyone else in year two. And it'll be pretty interesting to see if they can live up to that. What are you watching for most this weekend? I believe this weekend in the spring game. Uh, <laughs> not too much, honestly. This is yeah. it's not a game, first off. Like, uh, I know people approach it differently, but Kalen has said pretty honestly, like they have 15 practices. They intend to use all of them, so they're going to do scrimmage periods, but it's really not going to be a game. Uh, I just think that, like, like I sort of mentioned, the difference between good and great with this team is – whether they can develop depth and on their edges right now with their pass rush and also in their secondary, whether they can just have guys both at safety and corner because they haven't really had a guy at safety since Taylor Rapp in 2018. So uh, I think that their linebacking core is pretty strong at this point. They've got enough guys in the defensive line. Their offense, I think, is very, very good. Uh, there's going to be some question marks around their offensive line. That I think it'll still be very solid, but Offensive line and secondary play are the biggest things that you see how this uh, continues to uh, expand. And if, if they can get the play that they want from those two areas, then everything that they say about themselves, they have a chance to achieve those, those dreams. 
How, how much have you looked at the uh, 2023 schedule? Uh, a lot. I haven't booked flights yet, but I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an interesting schedule because, you know, it starts off and it just feels to me like there are landmines. It's not not necessarily the type of schedule that you look at and say, okay, there's a murderer's row. There is a stretch where they've got USC on the road, come back home against Utah back-to-back weeks. That'll be tough. But, you know, starting out the season, Boise State, okay, two weeks later, on the road at Michigan State. Like, I don't know what to expect from either of those teams. On the road at Arizona doesn't present to me like it should be a losable game, but Arizona felt plucky in spots last season, and they will be better. After a bye week, home against Oregon, then you've got a couple a couple weeks off before you've got the road game against USC before you come back home against Utah. So it's a tester of a schedule. On the surface, I don't know if it's going to get its fair shake for how difficult it could be, but it will certainly provide a test for DeBoer in year two. Yeah, there's no question. I think what everyone goes to right away is that November stretch that you mentioned. You have USC on the road which presents itself as a monster matchup. But then you've got, you got Utah at home, and that's the team that's won the Pac-12 the last two years. Then, you know, Oregon State is a legitimate Pac-12 contender with DJ at QB on the didn't road. Even, didn't even mention Oregon State, but absolutely. In a re- yeah, in a renovated stadium. And then I believe you go straight into the Apple Cup, which UW has mostly dominated in the last decade, but you just never know with the Apple Cup. It's a little bit of a different deal. Like you said, I mean, it's one of those situations where they, they won out their last seven games, I believe, last season. Um, This is going to be a massive challenge. But also, if you just focus on that, you're forgetting that in your opener, you're going to be favored. But Boise State was pretty good last year, too, and that's a sneaky game. And Michigan State, we have no idea what Michigan State's going to be. Um, On the road, in that environment, in Big Ten country, UW took one of their best young players in Jeremy Bernard in the transfer portal this offseason. But – there's an awful lot there, and that's a team that got sort of embarrassed in Seattle last year, and, and they're going to have an awful lot of motivation to not let that happen again. So I think if they can go into that November stretch undefeated, then it's just, you know, you 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 know you put your cards down and you see what happens. But uh, there's also some some sneaky games prior to that that we'll see if they can, you know, get through that, that part of the schedule unscathed. All right, before I let you go, Mike, from uh... – from your perspective, as you've been following the team here through the off season, it, give us kind of like a, a, I don't know, a surprising prediction, just some, something that we can use on social media to promote this. I don't know. Something that you've been looking forward to this coming season that, um, that more people should be aware of. Um, surprising prediction. I think this is a team that is thought of a certain way, and that's that Mike, Mike Penix is going to throw it. 80 times and they're going to lead the, you know, lead the country in passing. I do think that that'll be a massive part of their team, but I also think that they've built a ton into the running back room where we haven't seen a bunch of Dylan Johnson this off season because he's had some injury stuff, but that dude is all of six, one, 225, 230, And I think is a different kind of back than they've had in their program and that many PAC 12 programs have. And I think if you get him with a Cameron Davis, some other guys in the running back room, They've got a chance to be really interesting from a running perspective. The balance they have offensively, I think that'll be fascinating. Uh, defensively, you know, they've got depth issues on their edge, but Braylon Trice is really, really good, and I don't know how many people know that. And then ZTF is the question of a guy who was an All-American in 2020 and has never quite been the same guy towards Achilles the next spring. Uh, if he can be on those two guys lining up next to, you know, on, on opposite sides have the opportunity to be one of the better edge pairings in college football. So, you know, like I said, there's a lot of issues in terms of secondary play and, and what's going to happen there. But I'm curious just to see them rush the passer and to see where Braylon Trice specifically what he can be, where he's just gotten so much better year after year the last three years. So a couple things there, uh, edge play and also the running game, I think, could be a little sneaky. I, I will take that, Mike. Thank you so much for your time. Mike Varell, Washington Huskies football reporter for the Seattle Times. Make sure you follow him at Mike Varell on Twitter. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you.